So now we're going to go on and calculate the moment of inertia for our cross-section. So I've just added uh, a second instance of the same cross-section just because I don't want to erase the other ones and we're going to use slightly different uh, dimensions or key uh, components of the cross-section in the calculation. Uh, however, we are going to use the same area sections, so section 1 and section 2, the flange and the web like we did before. So I'm just going to add those in there now. So we've hatched out our, our two areas that we're going to use to build up our section. So what I want to do before we get started is to actually write down the equation for the parallel axis theorem, which is the theorem that's going to allow us uh, to calculate the moment of inertia for this section. So the moment of inertia, I, uh, about the xx axis in this case, is equal to the sum of, so this sum will be applied to each of the specific areas that we've hatched out, its moment of inertia about its own centroidal axis plus its area, A at I, multiplied by the distance D between the centroidal area of the section and the centroidal area of the composite section. And that is squared, which gives so much impact to the flanges in a composite section. So what I want to do is to identify on the cross-section, before I get started, these distances D1 and D2, so that we're very clear, because they're different than the Y1 and Y2 we used in calculating the centroid. So I'll go up here, and I'm going to denote the distance or the location of the centroid of area 1 and its distance from the centroid of the composite section and I will label that as D1. And I'll then go down, find the centroid of area 2, and label its distance D2 between the centroid of the composite section and the centroid of the individual section. And what we do, just as we did in part 1, is we look at the geometry and the dimensions of the cross-section and we figure out what these are by inspection. So we know that the centroid of area 1, half the thickness of the flange from the top, uh, is located at 275 millimeters up from our reference plane. Our y bar is at 200 millimeters from the reference plane, and so our difference here is 75 millimeters. Similarly, we go down, we look at area 2, halfway up a 250 millimeter uh, web is 125 millimeters. The difference between that and the location of the centroid of the composite section at 200 millimeters is again 75 millimeters. The fact that they turned out to be the same number in this case is pure coincidence. So now with that information clearly highlighted we can go back over to our parallel axis theorem and start filling out the numbers. So we will take care of area 1, then area 2. We'll do that in succession as implied in formula. One thing we do have to know before we can carry on is that the moment of inertia for a rectangular cross-section is equal to bh cubed over 12 where b is the width and h is the height. So we can bring that in here. So for area 1 we see that it has a width of 300 millimeters and a height of 50 millimeters, which would be cubed. All that's divided by 12. So that gives us I naught naught for area 1. Its area is 300 millimeters multiplied by the 50 millimeters. And its distance 1, we calculated down here to be 75 millimeters. And that needs to be squared. So for area 2, we apply the same process. I'm just going to write it down here underneath so I don't run out of space on the screen. We apply bh cubed over 12, but in this instance, the width is the narrower of the two dimensions, which is to say 60 millimeters. And the height, as we figured out before, was 250 millimeters, which would be cubed, all divided by 12. Now its area, 60 millimeters multiplied by 250 millimeters and D2 75 millimeters that would be squared all in brackets. So now it's just a simple matter of doing the math and we can figure out that the moment of inertia of this cross-section is 2.50 times 10 to the 8th millimeters to the 4th.